morning, Mr. Robinson. Hey, how's it going, Aura? It's going. I just, I'm, I'm like setting up some leaven because I'm making sourdough bread. You know how it is. Uh, yes, I also made some bread yesterday. I made a uh, herb bread because uh, that's a lot cooler of a thing to do than trying to go to a grocery store right now. What with everybody in being insane and hoarding. Uh, I'm actually glad that you kicked this off starting about food preparation because we're going to talk a little bit about food preparation today. Mr. Rob? Yep. The other day I went to Super King to the market and uh, some guy, one of the workers there, he walked in with like a dolly and two boxes on top that said bathroom tissue. Everyone started surrounding him, like asking for it, like trying to get some. And then um, he opens the box and it turns out to be like paper towels for like when you're eating. And everyone got like discouraged and walked away. Uh, all that stuff. I mean, I feel bad for the people who can't get their own supply of paper towels and toilet paper or whatever. Um, we just like use regular washable towels as paper towels, like to dry our hands and stuff, you know, like we're doing our best to conserve. But um, as soon as people, like, you can only hoard so much paper products at home before you run out of space. Um, I don't think that stuff will be anywhere near as scarce in a week or two once everybody gets their fill. But the bummer <laughs> is that it's going to affect sales in the long, long run when we need the economy to get back to normal. And people will be like, oh, I don't need to buy paper towels. I have six months worth. I was able to buy the last tissue paper box from Stater Brothers ever. Yeah, all of that I stuff found it there. Lies. I wouldn't worry too found much about it, it. Um, okay. So, uh, okay, yeah, class time. Looks like we're ready to go. Welcome in. Um, today we're gonna continue where we left off yesterday after a quick aside about food, food and foodstuffs. Um, Today we're gonna to do an opener where we're gonna talk about how good is the small angle approximation. And in order to do this exercise, we're gonna do it together because I want y'all, like now that we're all stuck at home at our keyboards, we all might as well get good at Excel. So please open uh, Microsoft Excel or Google Spreadsheets and title your new spreadsheet something like small angle approximation or how good is the small angle approximation. And then we're gonna do an exercise about that together. Um, and also, right now, I would like y'all to brainstorm some examples of some other oscillators uh, other than spring mass and pendulum, uh, just so that we could talk about them, because I want y'all to know that no matter how fancy the oscillator's yes. setup is, it's going to follow the same math, because we're going to show today that the solution for the pendulum is the same as the solution for the spring mass, as long as you know what substitutions to make. Uh, but first off, about food and food production, because um, people are hoarding food, which I think is uh, ridiculous and is actually going to contribute to more problems in the long run, because instead of people who need food being able to purchase food, people are hoarding food, so I guarantee more food than normal is going to go bad in people's refrigerators, which is already too high of a percentage, almost as much as one third of food ends up being wasted and thrown out. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about farming and gardening before we get going. Uh, just because I saw recently on Reddit slash r slash science page that if 10% uh, of people used their lawn space to garden, that would actually be enough land to provide 15% of food necessary for that region. Um, and I think that that's interesting mostly because it scales non-linearly. So the more that we garden, the more food that we can provide, but it's not linear. So 10% of gardening space can feed 15% of people, 15% of gardening space can feed 20 to 25% of people, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so if y'all are interested, I can do a quick little primer on running your own home garden, even if you don't have specialized supplies for it. You don't need any of that stuff. Um, so would y'all like me to talk about it a little bit? Yes. Sure. Uh, also on top of that, you know, gardening's a relaxing thing to do. 
and we all find ourselves with a lot more time at home than usual, so there should be plenty of time to keep a nicely manicured garden. Um, so, uh, I am growing an industrial, not an industrial, I'm growing a lot of beans right now. Uh, simply because beans are easy to grow in a small space. They grow very quickly and they have a high yield. So it's one of the few things that you can garden at home where you will actually make a net profit on calories in terms of how hard you have to work on the garden versus how much food you get back. And the other nice thing about beans is that if you dry them out and husk them and store the dried out hardened beans inside of a glass jar, it lasts basically indefinitely so should you be doing this because you must eat and not just because you want to have some fresh beans, uh, this will produce a food product which is good indefinitely. So I start off with some dry beans and I uh, germinate them in what's called the paper towel method, where you take beans and you place them inside of a little container here um, with a moist paper towel, not soaking wet, but like sprayed down with a little bit of water. So you'll see on this top layer, these beans haven't germinated yet, but down below, Oh, hey, we have a root. This little guy down here has produced a root. So now this guy is ready to be planted. Be careful when they sprout because it's hard to tell whether or not this is a stem or a root and you don't want to put it in the wrong way. Otherwise, it'll grow the wrong direction and just die underground. Uh, so let them get a little bit bigger and they should produce two tendrils, one stem and one root. Uh, and so these guys will be ready to plant in about three days. Uh, but it's spring, so I was gardening anyway, even before I knew that we were going to get sent home. And so I do have some beans that are a little bit further along. This bean, Ooh. he's at about uh, five days of growth. Uh, and you can see that he's got the two main leaves. And an interesting thing is the bean itself, I don't know if y'all can see this. You see those two little lumps down there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is the bean itself. So the bean has opened up, grown a root down and leaves upwards, and it's actually consuming the calories from the bean in order to make the sprout, which is why they sprout so quick. Um, is that first part okay? Yep. Okay, so here's how you too can do this at home, and if you have like beans in the fridge or whatever, this is a thing that you can do with them. Uh, like if you take one of those pods, uh, let open it up and then let the beans dry out. You wanna dry them first before you plant them, and then after they're dry, you submit them to the paper towel technique and you'll get them to sprout. So instead of having you know, five beans to eat, you could have five bean plants producing beans for weeks. Uh, let me show y'all a little bit of my gardening setup and the basics of like how you want to garden. Uh, I'm gonna change my screen share over to PowerPoint. And uh, do y'all see the PowerPoint? Yes. Cool. Um, so here's what you're looking at. Uh, this is my urban garden. So on this slide here on the right, um, these are some ways that you can grow potted plants without pots. So this blue bag is just an Ikea bag. Oop, sorry. The blue bag is just an Ikea bag. And then inside of that are bags of soil. And I just slash them open. I'm gonna grow beans directly in there. Uh, on that table also, in the background, that dying plant is thyme. Uh, the one to its left is an avocado tree that I'm growing, and then the one to the left of that is a pineapple plant that I'm growing. Um, if you didn't know, you can just take the top of a fresh pineapple, twist it off, and put it in water, and it'll grow roots, and they grow one pineapple a year. Uh, and then on the left is my bean plant, and you'll see I made a trellis around it with some little strings, because plants which crawl uh, grow a lot quicker if they have something to grow on. So if you're going to grow some beans or peas, um, be sure to set up a trellis. It can double or even triple the yield. Uh, in this second slide are some of my other plants. The one on the right there, that's a jalapeno. That's nice. It actually produces jalapenos constantly. Um, so I never buy those even when they're available at the grocery store, just because I always have them on the vine ready to go. And then the one on the left there is peas. And even though that pea plant is almost like two feet tall, it's only about two weeks old and it's about to have fruit and it'll keep producing fruit for a good uh, month or two before it dies naturally. Nice. Uh, is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, all of this production is going on on my like city find <coughs> balcony, you know? Um, and so here's how you want to think about gardening. Uh, the United States is broken up into various gardening regions. 
uh, and these zones are standardized, zones two through 10. Uh, the closer you get to the equator, the higher the zone number grows. It's just a description of temperature. And then the further north you go, the lower the zone number grows. And if you go into Canada, you get to zone uh, one, zero. And I think there's a zone negative one, but that doesn't matter because it's so cold that you can't farm there anyway. Uh, so this means that us down here in LA, that puts us in zone um, eight or nine, depending on exactly how far south you are. But for the most part, you can treat LA like a zone eight. And so if you know that you are in a zone eight, you can look up a zone eight growing chart, which tells you when you want to plant certain um, crops so that they then become harvestable. Green means you want to start it indoors. Once you get it to sprout, and it gets to the orange phase, that's when it's time to plant it in the soil that it's gonna grow in for the most part of its life. And it'll produce harvestable food for the entire red part. Uh, so right now in the middle of March is the time that you wanna be transplanting uh, beets, broccoli, cabbage, carrots, cauliflower, kale, lettuce, onions, peas, peppers, spinach, and tomatoes. Squash will start a little bit later. And uh, for times like these, it's good to choose the ones that have a very short growing time uh, peas, kale, lettuce will all have a real quick turnaround. On top of that, if you're growing kale or lettuce, I think it's interesting that you can just harvest leaves off of the plant to eat. And so long as it remains planted, it'll just keep regenerating those indefinitely for the entire time that it's planted. If you want to uh, avoid the nightmare that has become the grocery store, I highly recommend gardening. Wait, Mr. Raw? Yep. Um... Is there, is there a, like a chart like this, but for like other fruits? Um, so the chart is not based on the fruit. The chart is based on the zone. So um, if you type in zone eight growing chart or whatever, you might have to like Google around a little bit to find some good ones. Uh, it, there are more robust ones that have more different types of fruits and vegetables on them. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, are there any other questions out there about gardening before we get down to the physicses? Yeah. No, okay. No, we're good. Okay, so what we're gonna do, uh, like I said, is we're gonna get a little bit better at Excel. We're gonna do an exercise together here where we're gonna figure out exactly how good is the small angle approximation. Because just as a quick reminder from yesterday, we said that we are going to be abusing a trick of mathematics in order to make a problem more solvable. This is to say that uh, I don't want to solve a differential equation that involves sine. So, DLC Desmos? Yes. yes. So instead of solving it with the function sine, we're just gonna say that for very small angles, sine x is equal to x. Because as you can see here, the blue graph is just x, the red graph is sine. And as long as you know we're here, yeah, that's really close. That is a very, very close value to sine. But the further away we get from that origin, the more and more they diverge. And once you hit this first peak, I would say that this is a bad number. This is too big of an angle to use the small angle approximation for. So the question is, how good is the small angle approximation for certain angles? Where is it appropriate to use and where is it inappropriate to use? And so to do this exercise, let's go ahead and start by writing down the equations um, that we're going to use. And this is a thing that um, my best computer science professor ever taught me. It was a thing that I always took for granted. Her name's Dr. Kamai, she's at Caltech. Um, and even though you're smart and you might know how Excel works, it is always important to write down a hand draft of the equations that you are about to code, just because it will make it that much easier when you code them out. So here's what we're gonna do. Normally, right, uh, what metric do we use to look at our scientific data and determine whether or not it is good? What number do we always calculate at the end of every lab and we're like, hey, based on this value, our data is good or our data is bad? Error. Percent Percent error. error. That's what's up, <laughs> percent error. So this is going to be one of the things that we're about to code into Excel. And who knows the percent error equation? There's no like theoretical. Theoretical minus experimental over theoretical. Theoretical minus experimental divided by theoretical. Times 100%. Times 100%. Times 100%, which we uh, only use that so that we have a percentage instead of a regular old decimal. And what we're going to code into this Excel sheet is our theoretical is going to be our actual value of sine 
this is going to be sine of x. And guess what our experimental is going to be in terms of determining this um, percent error that the small angle approximation produces? Would it be x? It is just x, because we're saying for a small angle, maybe that number there can just be x. Now, the only thing that's going to make this more annoying to code in, the thing that we have to account for, is the fact that when you do angles in uh, Excel, guess what it uses? Do you think Excel uses degrees or radians? Degrees. Excel sadly, sadly uses degrees, sadly. yeah. Oh, so we are going to have to force Excel to use radians instead. So this angle here, we're gonna type it in in degrees because I know y'all think better in degrees, but we're also going to create another column that takes all of these angle measurements in degrees and converts them to radians. And so it's important to keep in mind that a radian measure is equal to a degree measure, but to convert it over, we're gonna to have to hit it with a certain multiplier. What's a full circle in uh, degrees? Two pi. In radians, it's oh, two pi, sorry. but in degrees, it's? 360. 360. So if I say that 360 is equal to 2 pi, I can divide both sides by 2, and that's going to give me pi equals 180. That's our conversion factor. So radians are equal to degrees multiplied by pi, then divided by 180 degrees. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to Excel, and we are going to code in these four pieces of information so that we can see how the percent error of the small angle approximation increases as we get to bigger and bigger angles, just so that we have an idea of how good this approximation is for certain angles. So I'm going to go ahead and move my screen share over to Excel now. Uh, can you all see that? Yes. yes. Okay. And now today we're going to take the time, since we're all stuck at home on our keyboards, to get a little bit better at Excel. So I'm going to go ahead and start off by naming my columns with what they are going to contain, just because it's good practice. So for my first column, I'm going to go ahead and say that this is my angle measure in degrees. And then in column B, I'm going to say that this is my angle measure in radians. In column C, I'm going to say that this is my small angle approximation. Uh, in column D, I'm going to say that this is sine of x, or whatever my angle is. Or let's keep it simple. Let's just call it sine. And then over here on the right, oh, come on, give me the mouse. Okay. And then over here on the right, this is going to be our percent error. We have a question in the chat. Um, wait, Mr. Rob. Yes. Wait, could, we, could we use like Google Spreadsheet too, right? Yes. Everything that I'm about to do here is exactly the same as Google Spreadsheets. Both Excel and Google Spreadsheets can do the exact same things. For you to get to the place where those two are different, you would have to be doing some extremely, extremely complicated calculations. Okay, thank you. Yup. Okay, so let's go ahead and start off with the degrees column. So I'm gonna go ahead and start in and I'm gonna type in, and you'll see very quickly why we're doing this in Excel and why we're not doing this by hand or with a graphing calculator. I want to know all of the small angle approximation percent errors for every angle from zero to 180. That's a lot of angles, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so for us to do that by hand, we would have to be doing 181 separate calculations. But whenever you find yourself saying, hey, am I about to do the same tedious math again and again and again and again and again and again and again? The answer to how you do that best is always a spreadsheet. Here's why. Zero one and two, I'm not going to type in all of the integers from zero to 180. Instead, after I type in zero, one, two, I'm just going to select them and I'm going to drag them down and I'm going to lose my mind because we're all stuck at home. I'm going to pull it all the way down to 180 and it will automatically fill in all of the values from zero to 180, one integer step at a time. Are there any questions on that first part? No. No? No. Wait, how would you do it again? <laughs> Oh, sorry. Type in, type in zero, one, two, select yeah. those three cells, and then grab it by the bottom right corner. You'll see a little box here. You grab that box, and it's going to follow the pattern. And the nice thing about it is no matter what like fancy pattern you might be doing, let's say you're counting by threes for whatever reason, three, six, nine, it will automatically realize that is what you are doing. And when you drag it and pull down, it will follow that pattern. Okay, cool. Got it. Thanks. Yep. 
Okay. Uh, so Mr. now, Robert, yes. Um, do we have to fill it until the until uh, row 180 or until the numbers inside are at 180? Until the numbers inside are at 180. So since the title okay. is one row and we started at zero, it'll go all the way to 182. Okay. Good? Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I'm going to convert it to radians because the small angle approximation is not talking about degrees. The small angle approximation is only talking about radians. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that this cell is equal to, and once you type equal into an Excel spreadsheet, it knows, pop, we're actually talking about an equation. So now I'm going to say that this is equal to my angle measurement in degrees. And notice when I click the box, it becomes a colored A2 because I am referring to the cell A2. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is going to treat whatever is in this cell as a variable and it's going to do math with it over here. And so our conversion equation from um, degrees to radians is what? What do I need to multiply the degree measurement by? Pi over 180. Pi over 180. So I'm going to multiply this asterisk by the contents pi. And in um, Excel, pi is a function. So this is really weird. But oh. to make this work out, you have to type in pi and then open parentheses, close parentheses. It doesn't take any term inside of it, but it just, you have to put that there so that it knows that you're talking about the function pi and then slash 180 so that it multiplies by pi and then divides by 180. And then I'll close the parentheses just so that that multiplicative term is closed. And then when I hit enter, it will do it for us. And of course, zero times pi divided by 180 is still zero. Uh, now, here is the amazing part and why we love Excel. Instead of converting all of these degrees to radians by hand, if I just take this box and yoink it down, it will automatically convert every single one of these degrees to radian measure. And notice by the time that we're at 180, 180 times pi divided by 180, the 180 and the 180 will cancel. Right here, it's just returning to us its estimate of pi. Well, uh, Mr. Rob? Yeah. I'm having trouble uh, grabbing the boxes and then dragging it all the way down. Like, I'm not sure. You select it and you don't grab any edge of the box. There's a, a block that appears in the bottom right. You grab that block. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Y'all see what I'm saying here with all mm. of these radians? So these are the radian measures for all of the degrees between 1 and 180. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now for the next part, the small angle approximation. This is just saying that instead of taking sine of the angle, instead we are just going to accept the radian measure as being equal to the sine value itself. So this part's even easier. I'm just going to say that this is equal to what this is in radian measure. It's just the same as that column to the left. So I'm just going to say it's equal to B2, and I'm going to take that and I'm going to drag it down. These two columns will be the same. This is just for the sake of it being like very explicit, right? And now for the sign part. Again, whenever we type an equation into Excel, I'm going to start off by hitting this with an equals. So this is going to be equal to sign. And notice that it's in our recommended list of uh, functions. Parentheses. And keep in mind, Excel does trig with degrees, not with radians. And so in order for this to work out, I need to give it the angle measurement in degrees. So I'm going to select my degree column over here on the left, A2, close that. Sine of zero is zero, which looks good. And again, when I drag it down, it knows I'm referring to column A. So all of these will just refer back to column A. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I was wrong. It's actually doing trig with degrees. I'm sorry, it's actually doing trig with radians. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't do what I just did. Okay. Oh, shoot. I, I apologize. It is actually doing trig with degrees. I thought for sure, I'm sorry, it's doing trig with radians. Mm -hmm. I thought it was doing it in degrees. No, it totally does it in radians. So I actually want sine of my radian column, which is B2. So then I can take that, drag it down. There we go. That looks right. So this is sine of B2, so it's taking sine of my angle in radians. 
And now for percent error, what did we say that percent error equation was? Theoretical minus um, experimental over theoretical. Tight. So we're going to say that our percent error is going to be equal to theoretical, which is our small angle approximation, minus experimental, which is our, I'm sorry, uh, theoretical, which is our sine value, minus our experimental, which is the small angle approximation, then divided by our sine value again, because that is our theoretical. And then when we're done, we're going to take this and we are going to multiply it by 100. So I'm going to put the 100 up front just so that it's nice and clean. So it's going to be 100 times D2 minus C2 divided by D2. This first one is going to give us an error simply because it's zero and we're dividing by zero. So this won't be a very good metric for this first measurement. But I'm going to go ahead and enter it anyway. It's going to say, hey, don't do. I'm a computer. I can't divide by zero. But if we take it and we drag it down through all of the non-zero values, it will be able to produce for us a percent error for all of these other numbers. And notice it's negative for some of these uh, because of the order in which I entered them, though you should know that percent error is always positive. So here's what's up with the small angle approximation. Uh, for the small angles, the percent error is, well, small. For one degree, it's only 0.005% off. In fact, all the way up until uh, about 15 degrees, the percent error is less than 1% different. However, as we march on through the angles, once we get to 30 degrees, we're about 5% off from the correct answer. And as we head down here, we very quickly lose our minds and we get to places where we're at 100% error, which is to say that it's worthless. But this is just a way that we can tie a hard and fast number to how close or how far off is the small angle approximation <coughs> as we increase the angle. Um, is this okay? Mm -hmm. It's why working. Okay. Uh, let me go ahead and switch backwards to my document cam. And hey, that's how we figure out how close or how far is the small angle approximation. Uh, since the beginning of the class, which was about 25 minutes ago, were y'all able to think of any other oscillators maybe? Yeah. Like what? What you got? You know how when like, okay, so I don't know if this makes sense, but like a bird on water and the water is rippling. Absolutely. So uh, water itself, and that's what we call a mechanical wave. Uh, because water is a fluid, gravity wants that surface on top to be flat. So if you take it and you lift it a little bit and displace it, gravity will pull it back down and you will get that oscillatory motion as it overshoots that equilibrium position. Next chapter, we're gonna talk all about how we can take these mathematics and extend them up to mechanical waves. Any other general oscillators out there? Did we, we already talked about the magnets, right? Yeah, so that, there was that case with the block on the ramp. So what pulls the block down the ramp in that lab? Gravity. And then what pushes it back up? Uh, repulsion. Yeah, the magnetic force itself. And so that is an oscillator. However, solving its differential would be extremely difficult. And here's why. In the spring, the spring is doing both the pushing and the pulling. In the pendulum, gravity is doing both the pushing and the pulling. In a case where you have two different types of forces acting as your restorative force, you have gravity going down but magnets going up, instead of the force equation having one term, how many equations would it have to have? Instead of the force equation having one term like it does with the spring, how many terms would it have to have? Two. You'd have to have two. You'd have to have an mg sine theta for the fact that it's on a ramp, and you would have to have some sort of magnetic force equation for what pushes it back, which means your differential would be of a second degree differential instead of a first degree. And don't get me wrong, if you wanna lose your mind and learn a bunch of math, right, you could solve that system, but it would be radically difficult. You would like, that is a math problem that's so nasty, you'd have to look up the answer in an encyclopedia. You wouldn't be able to just do it by hand willy nilly, I don't think. Also an excellent question. Um, okay, so let's just go ahead and pick up with yesterday's notes so that we can uh, wrap up this pendulum thing. 
uh, and then um, I could take questions, yeah? Okay, so to pick up where we left off yesterday, we said that if we hit the um, pendulum equation with the small angle approximation, instead of having to solve the equation, d squared x divided by dt squared is equal to g sine theta, because this is a bummer, right? Instead, we can say that d squared x dt squared is equal to g just times theta, as long as we limit ourselves to small angles. And like we just showed in the warm-up, yo, this is not a bad approximation. Even if you limit yourself to the case where we're going to stay within 30 degrees on each side, we're only going to be 5% off at most. And I guarantee you, if you're doing this in a laboratory situation, other sources of error will be bigger than that 5%. Though, just a quick note about the small angle approximation, that is some garbage that engineers do. That is some garbage that mathematicians, I'm sorry, it's some garbage that engineers and scientists do. Mathematicians don't do this. Never talk about this in front of a math major. Things will get bloody. Uh, nonetheless, let's go ahead and take this and solve it. And let's go ahead and start off by figuring out what a good swap for theta actually is. And let's go ahead and uh, redraw uh, that diagram that we drew yesterday with the pendulum. So here's my pendulum at its lowest position. And here's the bob on it. Not a technical term, but for whatever reason, the weight on a pendulum, we call it a bob. Nonetheless, um, we pull our pendulum William out this way. Wait. No, that's Bill. What's Bob short for, Robert? Yeah. Yeah, okay, we pull our pendulum Robert out to the left. Now it's out this way. And so here's the angle theta that we're trying to talk about. And so I want to be able to make a swap for this because notice this differential here is in X's. And so this needs to be, well, in X's as well. Uh, what were some terms I could toss on here? What's this? Yeah, but how long was it? What variable did we toss on there? L. Yep, we said that this was L, right? And so since the string doesn't change length as the pendulum goes back and forth, I can also say that this here is L, right? And if we want to simplify our math, we'll say that the displacement of the pendulum is just, well, how far do I pull it left? So this here will be our x. That's our displacement from the center, but in terms of length instead of in terms of angle. Is this okay? Yes. Okay, so uh, this is a right angle because gravity points straight down. And so, so ka toa, what is sine of theta? Mm -hmm. X over, X over L. Okay. L. Dank X <laughs> over L. And now we are going to hit this with the small angle approximation, which is going to upset all of the math majors in the chat. Theta <laughs> is basically equal to X over L. That's close enough, right? We're only going to be 5% off as long as we keep our pendulum to 30 degrees or less. And so I'm going to take this and I'm going to make that swap in here for theta. So the differential that we are solving is actually d squared x dt squared is equal to g times x over l. Is this okay? Yes. Yeah. Oh, and I'm sorry. I'm actually missing one thing on here. Um, when I displace this to the left, which way does the acceleration point? Negative. Like so this is a negative displacement, but which way would gravity pull it? Oh, to the right. Oh, to the right. Back to the right. And when I pull the pendulum out to the right, gravity would pull it back to the left. So that means that this is actually missing a sign. I'm going to have to make one side of this negative so that it's a restorative force. My apologies. I'm going to just hit the left-hand side with a negative here. And so what we're solving is this differential equation. And it is totally solvable now that I have this in terms of x's, and I have this in terms of x's. And so I'm going to, 
one other thing. This first line is tr perfectly true. The rest of this is an approximation. The rest of this will give us an answer that's within 5% as long as we remain within 30 degrees. And so I'm going to take this to the next page and we're going to solve it. But it turns out we've already solved it. We've already solved it. So let's go ahead and say that we are currently trying to solve negative d squared x dt squared is equal to g over lx. What was the other differential equation that we solved in order to figure out how a spring mass was going to work? What was that differential, y'all? Was that the one that was um, g times theta? No, that, that's the correct differential for how we solve the pendulum. This is the approximate differential for how we oh. solve the pendulum. I'm saying before school shut down, what was that other system oh. that we solved out? Minus kx? Yeah, the spring, right? So yeah. let's go ahead and take this and compare this to the equation of a spring's differential. So for our spring, it was negative d squared x dt squared is equal to negative what? Minus kx. Minus kx. So uh, go ahead and notice here. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, if I put the negative on this side, then this side is positive. Uh, notice here, hey, these two seem real similar, don't they? Yes. What's similar about these equations? What parts are secretly equal? The x. x. The x part is equal. So what this differential is saying is that, hey, these are both just linearly dependent on the displacement. And this stuff up front, that's just a constant, right? Yep. This jazz is just a constant, and uh, this jazz is just a constant. This is just the constant k. So in terms of the solution to our pendulum, this will play the exact same role as this k here. And so I'm going to leave this as an exercise for y'all in the homework. But if you say in the equations, right, the thing that we're solving that, well, the spring constant k is actually just a lot like the role that g over l plays, you can show that for the solution of our uh, equation of motion here for a spring mass, what was it? We said that x as a function of time was going to be equal to a cosine of what? Squared of k over m? Root of k over m times time. Yeah. So we get this by saying, I need a function who is its own second derivative. And this lead constant ends up being k because of reasons, right? Um, oh, I'm sorry. Wait, this is missing something. Uh, this is divided uh, by m. Yeah, I was going to say it's missing that, sir. Yeah, this is missing divided by m. Because it's uh, ma is equal to kx. So oh. to get this over here, we divide both sides by m. So I think in the line that was read to me, there was an m over here. So that means k over m is actually approximately equal to g over l. But if you take this and you make this substitution in here, does that make sense how I'm comparing these two? Both of these are differentials. This has a coefficient k over m. This has a coefficient g over l. But everything else about these equations is the same. And that's how we know that for a pendulum, x is actually going to be equal to a cosine root g over l, then times x. I'm sorry, t. This is the equation of motion for a pendulum. And if you want all of the other equations of motion, they play out exactly the same. The only difference is everywhere you see a k over m, you swap it for a g over l. Uh, is that first part okay? Yes. Yep. Tight. Um, and so by making this small angle approximation, this allows us to ignore the fancy nonlinear motion of a pendulum, the sinusoidal stuff. And it turns out a pendulum is going to behave a lot like a spring. 
the only difference is instead of being dependent on the spring constant and the mass, this is going to be dependent on G and on L. So here's what we know about this motion, and we'll compare and contrast these two. This depends on the stiffness of the spring. What else does it depend on? Um, the mass. It depends on the mass. However, it does not depend on the length at all. That part doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how far you displace it. That's just going to uh, change the total amount of energy in the system, but it doesn't affect the timing. The timing is only affected by the stiffness and by the mass. Over here on the right-hand side, what is this being driven by? What are these two terms? What do they represent? Length of Position. the spring. Length. That's what L is. And what about this? Gravity. Acceleration due to gravity. So this is to say, man, on a planet with more gravity, a pendulum swings faster. You can actually use a pendulum and you can use this equation to carefully measure the amount of gravity on the surface of a planet that you happen to be on if you're not on Earth for whatever reason. If you take the length and you set it in motion and measure its timing, this function can tell you how much gravity is at the exact position that you're at. Also, there are places on Earth where the gravity is not exactly equal to 9.81. At the top of a very tall mountain, it's a little bit lower than it should be, and there are places that have extra iron ore in the ground, which increases the local mass of the ground, where the gravity will be slightly higher. And with a sensitive enough pendulum, you could again use this equation to detect those small differences in G. Hmm. Is this okay? Yes. Tight. And notice over here, where does G get plugged in to our spring mass? K. K. No. Nope. Over here on the left, ain't no gravity. This is why ain't nobody cares about what planet you're on if you're talking about a spring mass. Oddly enough, a spring mass system would oscillate exactly the same on every planet, no matter what. And over here on the right, what variable is not here? Mass. Yeah, yo, mass is not here. And again, we did this in our like lab activity that we did before school shut down. We showed that if I have two pendulums of the exact same length, but differing masses, then it does not matter. <clears throat> the different masses don't matter. Any two pendulums of the same length oscillate at the exact same frequency. So let me show y'all a couple things on these two items, and then I'll talk about what y'all's uh, homework is. What time is this period over? Am I over time? No, it's over at like, it's over in like 11 minutes. Perfect, yeah, just no, the time no, for this stuff. Not 11 minutes, like six. <laughs> so, just so y'all know, um, like I've mentioned to y'all before, I'm trying to be an astronaut, right? Did yeah. you know that they, it's really important for people on the International Space Station to keep track of their weight. Like, you need to know your body weight when you are in space because it could be a marker of health, right? If you're losing a bunch of weight or gaining a bunch of weight, both of those can be problematic. Except when there's no gravity, right, you can't stand on a bathroom scale to get back your weight. This right here is how they check body weight on the International Space Station. Oh. What? Mm hmm Yeah. So if you know what a spring constant K is that a spring has, and you know the time, you could reverse engineer this equation around to give you back M. Let me show you how they measure body weight on the International Space Station. Oh wait, sorry, the video's loading. Okay, um, ba -ba -ba, share my YouTube. Okay, uh, y'all that video? Yeah. yeah. Cool, so check this out, right? So uh, once a month they need to weigh themselves on the International Space Station but because a bathroom scale just doesn't work, right? You don't have gravity acting in a single direction to pull you down against a spring. 
and then use that spring constant in order to measure your weight. Instead, we, they use an oscillator. So that thing that he's strapping himself onto is a spring. We know what its spring constant K is because it was produced on Earth and calibrated very carefully. And once he releases it, it oscillates and sets him in motion. And based on the frequency of the oscillation, his body weight in kilograms can be calculated to a very, very high degree of certainty. Uh, assuming the spring constant K is held, you know, that doesn't change because that is a feature of the physical spring itself. How does the oscillation and the body weight go together? If you were heavier, what would the speed of oscillation be? It'd be faster. Faster. More so, massive gives us faster? No, slower. 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 Notice now that he's off of it and it's oscillating with no extra weight on it, it's oscillating way faster than it was before. But yeah, this use of springs uh, as oscillators is how they measure body weight on the ISS. Uh, is that okay? Yes. Okay. And then um, I believe this will be pretty seamless. I'm just going to close that and move on over here. Can you all see the pendulum simulator? Yes. Cool. I'll be posting this in Google Classroom also. Let's go ahead and run through the variables that we talked about just a second ago. So number one, I have two pendulums, uh, one and two. And uh, let's go ahead and start off by testing variable set one. Equal length, but different mass. You'll go ahead and notice here that when I take these two and I set them in motion. Oh, I guess I should try and actually sync them, huh? That the two oscillate with the exact same frequency. There's a slight delay between them because they have different amplitudes but they go back and forth in the exact same time. Is that first part okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, and now I am going to go ahead and I am going to make their masses equal, except I'm gonna make one shorter and as I make it shorter, what should happen to it? Faster. It's gonna go back and forth faster and faster and faster with each step that I make it shorter. By the time that we're at this large difference, you can see that it is a very, very large gap between their frequencies. And now here is an interesting thing that I can't do on Earth. Let's just increase the gravity. So if there is no gravity, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and what kind of conservation are we observing? Um, Something is going around with constant angular speed. What's being conserved? Momentum. What kind of momentum, linear or angular? Angular. Angular. Yeah, so with no gravity at all, if you had a pendulum that was in motion, now you're just talking about a spinner. But if I have a gravity, if I have just a tiny little bit of gravity, I'm actually gonna slow these down because we're now outside the small angle approximation. If I have a little bit of gravity the way there is on the moon, because things fall slowly on the moon, they'll oscillate back and forth slowly due to gravity. And as I increase the gravity, the higher the gravity is, the more frequent our pendulum motion becomes. Uh, is this okay? Yes. yes. Cool. So here's the last thing that I'm gonna mention, and then this is gonna be the topic of notes tomorrow, and it'll also be the topic of our lab. Because in my opinion, verifying these equations, it's a little too straightforward. It's a little too easy. That's why for our intro lab on this topic, we just went down to the lab and we tested to see how changing certain variables would change other outcomes of motion. In real life, things aren't frictionless. Instead, there is a friction. And how does having friction in this system, how does that affect motion? What do pendulums and spring masses do in real life over long periods of time? Slow down. Slow down and stop they do eventually slow down and stop. So you'll notice here, if I turn the friction way up, it's gonna bring these guys to rest very, very, very quickly, kind of how it goes on Earth. This is what we refer to as mechanical damping. Let me go ahead and switch back to my doc cam, okay? And so without damping, uh, in our idealized situation, Oh, hey, where's my, I don't see my webcam. I'm old. I don't know how technology works. Is my webcam still on the feed? Yes. Okay, I'm just going to, oh, there it is. Okay, type. Uh, 
without friction, right, idealized. For both of these functions, we should have a cosine wave that goes on forever and ever 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 ad infinitum. However, in our actual observation of this when we did our lab, what did the amplitude do over time? It got like shorter. It decreased over time. So our amplitude started off big, and as the motion went along with each repetition, it got a little bit shorter and 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 a little bit shorter, little bit shorter until it eventually dies off. This right here is what we refer to as damping. Damping is the effect of frictional forces. And what kinds of frictional forces do you think I'm talking about? It's not just friction, it's also, what else? Mm -hmm. Not just regular friction, there's more friction than just the string rubbing the point of contact. What else is the pendulum smashing the through? Air. Say that again? Air is this air. Absolutely true. It is also smashing through the air, right? So uh, of our frictional forces, not just literal friction, also consider air resistance. But damping is the effect of frictional forces on our oscillator, and it's actually really easy to adjust our normal equations to do this. In our normal equations of motion, x is going to be equal to a, our amplitude, then multiplied by cosine of root g over l, multiplied by time, which uh, is our standard equation for the solution to a pendulum's motion. But all we have to do to make it do this is instead of acceleration being, a, I'm sorry, instead of amplitude being a constant, like normally what it would be is like I pull my pendulum five centimeters over, oh look, the amplitude is five centimeters back and forth. Instead of this being a constant, we swap it out for a function. So instead, amplitude will become a function of time. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about what function it becomes and why, and how we can tune the constants within it in order to get the correct answer. Is this OK? Yes. OK. So here's what I want you all to do tonight for homework, along with you know continuing the book assignment, which we'll try and take a, a day to talk about. I said the data workshop, those questions will be Monday before it's due, right? Mm -hmm. yes. Perfect. What I want you to do tonight is I want you to take that um, Desmos sheet that I made yesterday that had all of the very fancy equations of motion for the spring mass. Uh, I can pull it up real quick if y'all don't remember, but I did, wait, am I crazy? Did I post the link to Classroom? Um, I didn't see it yet. I think I did yesterday. I posted the, ooh. Um, <laughs> I posted this spring mass every function. Uh, do y'all see that? Yeah, you posted it. Spring oscillator sheet. Yes. Uh, wait, do, is that what I'm sharing right now in the the heads up? Uh, I don't know. No, there's no video. It's just yeah. Our screen. Oh, whoop. Uh, share screen. Share this screen. Okay, is that correct now? Yes. yes. Okay. So here is your homework for tonight, real straightforward, but I'll be sure to post an assignment for it. And when you're done, all you have to do is uh, save it under your Desmos account and then shoot me a link. I want you to go in here and fix up all of these equations so that instead of talking about a spring mass, guess what I want you to have them talk about? Oscillator. A pendulum of an oscillator. Have it talk about the pendulum. So go through and everywhere you see K over M, swap it for G over L and have sliders for G and L so that you can fiddle with how these equations of motion are affected by the acceleration due to gravity and the length of the pendulum itself. Um, are there any questions on what that homework assignment is? Can you post that to Google Classroom, please? I will post it as an assignment and I'll also post the link to this original sheet one more time so that y'all can follow along with it. Okay. Um, are there any other questions out there? No. no, I think we're good. Okay, uh, so tomorrow we'll talk about damping, and there's three different kinds of damping that we have to discuss that are all different mathematically. Uh, and we'll also talk about how it is that our car's suspensions are so nice, because the fact that your car does not shake up and down every time you hit a speed bump 
uh, means that your car's suspension is properly damped. More on that tomorrow. But in the meantime, y'all have a nice day. And keep in mind that if you ever miss any of this stuff, it's all getting reposted to YouTube. Y'all have a nice day, and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. See you. Bye. Mm -hmm. see you. Yep. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. Bye.